So, 23rd today of the 3rd, 2.16. Right, heading, heading towards uh, the coming of the Lord. He will come at a time that nobody knows. I mean, the Lord, he could have set a time, couldn't he? And then everyone would get ready and all your loved ones will be saved and you know you can just sort of do what you want until um you know you get a month or so off and say oh don't forget the date the lord's coming or oh yeah i'll get organized i'll repent but the lord he doesn't do things that way he the lord does things in a way that he um will see if we're genuine if we're the genuine article and that's what he's looking for Jesus is looking for the genuine article he's not looking for numbers he's not a God of numbers he's a he's a God of quality not quantity and even as we go through life we come to see that you know volume is really not the answer you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather, I mean, a, 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 a feast a, a, and a feasting and, and, and a, um, a wing-ding do among family and friends and a reunion even. You know, they, it all looks great and everyone's there and hee hee ha ha, but... I don't believe that that can compare with a um, dry morsel in quietness with the Lord. <clears throat> I really don't see the comparison. I mean, it would be cruel to try and compare, you know, for the Latians' sake. And uh, so the Lord's going to come at a time that nobody knows. The Lord's designed it that way. Not, not even Jesus knows that time. That's the way Father has done it. This is in order to that we be ready every minute of the day. See, he wants us hot every minute of the day. Not seasonal. Has to be every minute of the day, no matter where we are, no matter who we're with, no matter what we're doing. We have to be ready that moment. He will come in the twinkling of an eye. And that's very, very brief, isn't it? Before we go into the message today in the in the Old Testament, I'd like to make mention of um, the churches of the world today and and, and uh, all their their fishing tactics in order to get people into their religion or organisation or ministry or whatever they call it, and. There's a lot of multicultural um, uh, draw cards. And I know after being uh, in the Word for 29 years this June, I know that um, it, it holds a lot of weight, you know, uh, when it comes to the public, if we go along with the multicultural thing. We go along with the multicultural beliefs and and play the card that it doesn't really matter you know um what culture you are you can hang on to your culture and hang on to, to your traditions and and still please the lord and go to heaven well that's not true that is not true the lord has shown us clearly in the scriptures that it is not true we can't hang on to our uh, earthly cultures and uh, traditions and be pleasing to the Lord. This is what the scriptures are all about, coming out from among them and being separated unto the Lord. This is what all this is talking about. And... Uh, 
Jesus doesn't put up with other gods. See, with every culture and every tradition of men, there's other gods. The Lord won't have that. Multiculturalism is another word for multi-god. There's all these other gods hanging around. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the writings of Samuel. Brother Samuel. And we're going to go to 1 Samuel. We're going to read a portion there just to confirm this multicultural. Look, I've had ministers tell me for years, it's okay, it doesn't really matter. As long as you love Jesus. Is it loving Jesus? Hanging on to your culture. If you're hanging on to your culture, I can guarantee you there's, there's gods behind every culture of man, every, every degenerated culture of man. There's only one culture that is not degenerated, and that is the culture of Yahweh himself, holiness. Because you go into it, the Africans, the, the island islanders, the, the, the Asians, the, the Irish, the English, go into their culture. Have a look at what they've got propped up as gods. 1 Samuel 5, verse 1. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon, and both the palms of its hands were broken off, broken off on the threshold. Only the torso of Dagon was left on it. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any who came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavily on the people of Ashdod and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. I'm talking bubonic plague. Tumors. You can't put another God in the same arena with Jesus. It can't be. You can't where there's other cut where there's cultures, there's gods. Simple as that. But there is only one wise God. Hey? 1 Samuel 5, 3. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And then they took it and set it up again. In, how arrogant. God had already face planted that thing. Hey? That 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 God, Dagon, had bowed down before the ark. And then they went and set it up again. Alright, let's read verse 4. And when they arose early the next morning. <laughs> There was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and the palms of its hands were broken off. Only the torso was left. You see very clearly. Useless. 
God was saying to the people of Ashdod, that thing is useless. It's got no brain. There's no head. There's no hand. It can't do anything for you. Get rid of it. Whether it's a tiki, I don't care what it is. You go and preach that in the churches in New Zealand and see what they say. They might behead you. You go down to Tonga and preach that. Look. Tongan people might be inheritant uh, descendants of a king. But I'm a child and I, I'm one of the king of kings. And that includes the, the, any king that was of Tongan. So I will very quickly and proudly forsake all things and people for Jesus. Just like that. I don't care who they are. If it has to be done, I don't even have to think about it. I don't even have to think about it. I already know. The Lord already knows. The Lord looks at the heart. When Nebuchadnezzar was eating grass like a beast, God was looking at his heart. Doesn't say anywhere in the writings of the scriptures that uh, Dagon said this and Dag uh, I should say that Nebuchadnezzar said this and Nebuchadnezzar said that. God was zeroed in on the heart. So we have a secret God in our heart. God knows who it is. And if that's the case, you will not be saved. That's not according to me, that's according to script. There's only one infallible script in the earth, and that's the word of God. I hang on to the infallible. You can keep the fallible. And the corruptible. It's useless. It's got no hands. It's got no head. Can't guide you. It can't help you. If you fall down, Dagon ain't able to pick you up. The cultural gods can't pick you up. They can't do anything. They're just idols. Made by man. And if an idol is made by man and your God is made by man how great is that God useless no better than a man actually no better than a dead man why well, look for the living among the dead Jesus said everybody said amen, amen. Hey? the Lord won't have one God sitting beside him let alone multi gods multiculture multicultural gods he won't have one sitting next to the ark the ark is a, a, a symbolic of the holy ghost and the word the ark of the covenant you do a study and see what was in the ark symbolic Of the Holy Ghost, the Word, and the angels who protect us, the cherubim. And the Lord won't ha stitch anything onto that. Anyone who tries to stitch anything onto that, and, and oh yeah, he can come in. Who said? You, who said? Who said you can share that degenerated God with Jesus' space in your heart? It cannot be. I know I won't be liked for saying this. People won't like me, they'll hate me. But it's the truth and I want people to go free. It's no good driving around in your, in your SUV 
with a big tiki on the back saying, I'm a Christian. you got to get rid of the daggone sign off the car first. You get rid of those idols. You get rid of that, those other gods. Whether they're the gods of the warriors or the gods of the warriors. I don't know. Get rid of them. And take the one. The one God. And save it and says, do not resist an evil man. Let him have his way. Let him do what he's going to do. I'll sort him. I'll sort him. In my way, the Lord says. You just let, don't resist an evil man. Someone hits you on this side, you turn the other cheek. If you've got a jawbone left, you turn the other cheek. The Lord, he don't worry, look. Nothing is impossible with thee. Great and mighty God. Full of wonder and mighty indeed. Let's go into the message today in the writings of Genesis. Genesis. 16. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice <coughs> of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abraham, My wrong be upon you. <laughs> I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. Thanks, Sarai. Hey? My wrong be upon you. It don't work that way, Sarah. It don't work that way. Your wrong be upon you. No one else. Hey? Your wrong be upon you. So, it's very clear, isn't it? Verse 1, Genesis 16, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. You see, when things don't happen, when things aren't happening the way we want it to happen, we take it into our own hands, don't we? We take it into our own hands and impatience kicks in. Impatience is not a fruit of the Spirit of God. Therefore, this impatience is not going to bear a goodly thing. Impatience. Sarai was impatient. Hey? The title of our message today is It's time to make it happen. It's time to make it happen. How many times have you heard it over the years? It's time to make it happen. That was the saying, and most probably still is the saying, of a false. Uh, teacher by the name of Joyce Meyer for, for quite a long time on her TV program she used to say all the time it's time to make it happen you know what I mean and she was referring to enjoying everyday life start enjoying everyday life well there's 
there's a there's a higher place than that there, there's a higher realm and place than enjoying everyday life and, and the world doesn't know about it and sad to say most churches and their ministers and ministries don't know about it either because otherwise they wouldn't say it's time to make it happen it's time to start enjoying everyday life the lord has done a work at calvary so we can have more than that because jesus came to give life and give it abundantly now jesus did not bring any material things into this world with him he, he jesus never brought or left as a legacy any material things so he's not talking about the abundance of material things is he the devil comes not but to steal kill and destroy and he's doing it today he's using the churches of the world the one world church the ecumenical church he's using the harlot church and all her prostituting followers to usher in and has been doing it for centuries usher in materialism into uh, the lord's house and as i said initially today and this morning multiculturalism multicultural faith which is no faith because true faith is only trust in one when you truly have faith in someone and you're truly faithful to someone it's only one and jesus he is that one that we're to have faith in and to be faithful to come what may no matter what the cost no one has left no king james version says no one has forsaken forsaken means abandoned no one has forsaken or abandoned house or wife or land possessions or children for his name so in the kingdom no one and has not been rewarded a hundredfold not 20 or 30 100 fold and eternal life in the next can someone say amen, amen. it's all of our message today it's time to make it happen boy boy i'd rather leave it alone <laughs> i'd rather take an abrahamic step back and say listen lot you take what you want of that i don't want any of it Oh, nothing to do with it. Because we're not our own anymore. It's not time to make it happen. It's not time for us to enjoy everyday life. Uh, look, I'm just not satisfied with everyday life anymore. Hey? It's just not enough. But I tell you what, Jesus is more than enough. He's more than enough. Oh, yes, he's more than enough. He's El Shaddai, the God of plenty, the all sufficient one, God Almighty. Jesus is more than enough. Jesus came to take us on to another level, take us on to another plateau, because he looked down upon the earth and he seen, God seen that the people in the earth were in dire strength. The people of the earth were needing salvation 
And the Lord wants to save us from us. He wants to save us from a lot of trouble. He wants to save us from taking things into our own hands. And we know what happens, don't we? People start killing. People start raping. When you take things into your own hands, people start stealing. They want it so bad, they'll steal it. They start lying. They want it so bad. They want to make it happen. They're thinking in their heart. It's time to start making it happen, you know. But it's not. That's what Eve said. She said, Adam, it's time to make it happen. It's just things aren't moving fast enough. We're going to do it this way. <laughs> We're not going to do it Yahweh's way. We're going to do it our way. I did it my boy oh boy how many have done it their way you know what we know by the, the, the most simple of scriptures any other way but Yahweh is, equals destruction the way of men and women seems right But the way thereof led it to destruction and death. Genesis 16. Look what happened. Look, I just can't believe how quick the Lord confirmed the, the, the sin of the God of self-will. Genesis 16 and verse 4. So when, so Abraham went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Straight away, look at the drama that came straight away. One minute. She's thinking that this Egyptian woman was going to save the day. Now she's on the verge of being booted out. You see the confusion that comes. You, you, you see the mindset here. How? I mean, what is going on? The, the woman done you a favour, so to speak, you know, an endemic favour. We don't need Adamic favours, we need messianic confirmation. We don't need Adamic favours. Hagar, being Egyptian, I mean, was open for anything, wasn't she, really? Well, little Egypt went out strut and wearing nothing but a ruby and a tomb. And here's little Egypt. <laughs> she did the hoochie coochie real slow. And did the hoochie coochie real slow. Sing it. Then little Egypt, here she is thinking, oh, well, I'll just do what the, my master, my mistress says. I'll just do what... Um, is going down here this is where I am I, I'm the servant girl I'm the maid and here it is so when this is verse 4 so he went into Hagar and she conceived and when she saw that she had conceived her mistress became despised in her eyes then Sarah said to Sarah, I said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. Now, this is a number two. Now she's dumping it on Abraham. Hey? I mean, things are turning pear-shaped real quick. <laughs> I gave... It, 
you see how confused Sarah is? She said, my, she's despising the mistress. And now Sarai said to Abraham, my wrong is not, I'm going to dump it on you. And then straight away she says, I gave, I gave my maid to you. And when she saw that she had conceived, I mean, did she, I just can't understand this woman. She's very hard to understand, isn't she? <laughs> is she a woman? Yes. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> like, hello. And she saw that she had conceived. I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Well, I mean, Sarah is out of order. She's totally out of order. Impatient and out of order. I mean, not just Sarah, but humanity has inherited that from Adam and Eve. Impatience and, and, and disorder has been inherited from the fall. Now, Jesus, who is the fall guy, he, <laughs> he compensated for humanity on the tree. And the, and the outcome, the, the outcome and the outworking of what Jesus done on the tree leads us totally away from such a mindset of taking things into our own hands. As Joyce Meyer says, it's time to make it happen. Time to start enjoying everyday life. Well, the Spirit of God does not put such things into your heart. That is just a degenerated mind. Time to start enjoying everyday life. I mean, the world does that. And it's so inferior and, and so mean. Alive. Everyday life. What a, what a, a drudgery. The Lord wants to lift us up onto eagle's wings where we can see the smallest of error and, and, and the smallest of disorder and impatience. Those who wait for the Lord, they mount up with wings like eagles, meaning God will show you the smallness of the world's ways. Because an eagle is way, 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 way up near the mountain tops. And that eagle can look down onto terra firma and see a lizard for entree. And zero in on that lizard and take that lizard for his morning tea. And that's like us. In the writings of Isaiah, those who wait for the Lord, they're not the impatient, not the disorderly, but those who wait for the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord, there'll be no regrets. We, we won't be kicking ourselves. We won't be doing a Judas. Oh, please, here's the money. Please, take the money back. Take the money back, please. Here it is. It's all here. I don't want the money. And the Pharisees sitting there so calmly in their temple. It was all like, you know, like, this is all like, I saw always picture of Roman Catholic priests sitting there, you know. 
in his presbytery sort of thing. And sort of Judas going in there, you know, terrified and shaking and fear of God was coming on him, you know. And he sort of had the money in the hand. He, he'd break it out into a cold sweat, you know. Here's the money, please take it back. I don't want... And, and, and the Roman Catholic priest sort of sitting there, you know, waiting for his morning tea. And uh, he looks up very casually and calmly and says, very cold, piercing, evil eyes, no thank you. And calls for one of the nuns to ask to remove the man. And then Judas goes out and hangs himself from the nearest gum tree, so you know, so to speak. Speaking of Roman Catholic priests, let me interrupt by saying this: that um, my sisters. When they used to go to the convent, my sister's around 70 year old now and older. And when they used to go to the convent, um, the Roman Catholic convent, they, they were taught each week different girls used to go to be selected to go to the priest's presbytery and to clean up and the nuns would come and select which girls and and um, my sister Lynn said we used to go into the presbytery and she said the smell was was just vile it it was so dirty she said there was ash all over the floor where the priest who used to smoke cigarettes and cigars would flick his cigarette and it wouldn't go into the ashtray, go on the floor. She said there was just wine bottles everywhere. Some with dregs in the bottom, you know. And they used to go there every week, different girls, and clean up and mop up after these Roman Catholic prunes. And I said to my sister, when she mentioned that only the, a week or so ago, and I said, what kind of example is that to eight-year-old girls? What kind of example is that? Cigar butts, cigarette packets lying on the floor, wine bottles. It, it, it sounds to me like a derelict wino. But yet, they have this tag, priest. Do, do the world know? Do the Roman Catholic Church know what a priest really is? A priest. God used to kill them if they went in his temple with, with sin in their life. He used to kill them. Strike them down there and then. I just thought I'd throw that in, in, in the, because it does relate to disorder, doesn't it? And that's what we're talking about today: impatience and disorder. The hallmarks of an unsaved person. Hey. Jesus said, "All things must be done." decently cigars and booze bottles aren't decent hey? doing our own thing isn't decent all things must be done decently and orderly there must be order order Mr Speaker order in the House of Parliament, there's order. 
and they go crazy today. They punch out each other. They bash each other. There's no order. And there's no order when you look into the parliament and you have a law and you see no order and you see no decency. You know there's no order and decency in the land. So in order to find decency and order, we must go beyond the land. We must go beyond the sunset. Beyond the sunset, some misty morning, when with my Saviour heaven has begun. We have to go to the rock, don't we? We're looking forward to a, a, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Righteousness does not dwell on planet Earth. It only dwells in the true believer. That's why we need fellowship one with another. That's why we need to gather together and, and assemble together. As the Lord said in the writings of Hebrews, that we're not to forsake the assembling together of the righteous one. Because things are done decently and orderly there. Can someone say amen? amen. There, you will not go to a church meeting on Sunday that is of the Lord and find cigarette butts and, and cigar butts and booze bottles in the pew. Can someone say amen? Hey? Amen. Huh? Told of a message today. It's time to make it happen. No, it's not. It's time to do nothing. <laughs> I like to spite the devil and do nothing at times, you know, and just sort of, because he, he, he likes to keep, I mentioned this this morning to a, Brother Samuel, I said the devil likes to keep you on the run. He likes to keep you moving all the time and you're confused and there's no time for the Lord. There's no time to meditate in his word. There's no time to contemplate on, on, on your love relationship with the lamb. Lamb love relationship. Because he is our lamb lord. And we love our lamb. Huh? We don't love ham, we love lamb. Okay. We know about Ham, Sham and Zaphir, don't we? And Ham was a real Ham. Big mouth Ham. Done the wrong thing by Noah, didn't he? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know what happened? So... The Lord wants to take us up. He don't want to put you down. He said, don't be proud. I haven't put you down. Be humble and I'll lift you up. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We're getting back to Sunday's noble heart, aren't we? The noble heart is the noble start. And then the noble middle bit and the noble end. Humble all the way. Humbling ourselves. Knowing that we're just passing through. We're frightened on missing out on something, aren't we? Edemic people are frightened on about missing out on something. Out there in the world. You know? I, I know because I was like that when I was a sinner. I had to be out every night. I had to be out wherever it was happening. Otherwise I thought I was missing out on something. And I, at the end of every night I find out I was missing out on nothing. But I go back the next night and do it again. That's how stupid I was. I, I just continued to repeat my folly. As the fool does. And now and then there is a fool such as I. Now and then 
There's a fool such as I. Pardon me if I... Genesis 16.1 says, Sarai said to Abraham, it's already predetermined, isn't it? Preconceived. Sarai said to Abraham, see now, she's explaining this to Abram. She's explaining it. See now, look, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. But I do what I am. I do what I want. I'm invincible. I am woman. I am woman. She's invincible. She's liberated. He, uh, uh, Sarai at this stage was a feminist, wasn't she? Not. She wasn't a true feminist. You know, a true feminist um, does what Jesus said. That's a true feminine woman. Quiet, gentle spirit. That's a true feminine feminine woman. But the women today like to think they're feminists. But they're only ever going to see feminine. They'll always be parched. They'll always be thirsty. They'll always be hungry. Hey? They'll always be thinking they're without. They'll always be thinking, oh, poor, poor, pitiful me. They'll forever be playing Linda Ronstadt albums. Because they're impatient and disorderly. There is an order and a way to do everything. Israel was renowned for it in the wilderness with their tents and their tent pegs. Everything was in order. Everything was done orderly and decently. Everything was so that they were living letters of the Torah. Living epistles. And everywhere they went, they knew. There they are. The Israelites. That's them. That's the Israelites. <laughs> hey. Are we living letters? Or are we going to go down the street with a cross and a wheel on it next week? That's not a living letter. That's just a spasmodic thing. That is a flash in the pan. You know? Here, today, gone, tomorrow. We need to be living letters. Highlighting the letter J. We need that J factor. The Jesus factor. Separated ones. Outside the gate. Not multicultural, but one cultural. Jesus. Holiness. Patience. Order. Order. Order! <laughs> Order! Lord, the Lord has restrained me. She knew very well, didn't she? So she said, it's time to make it happen, Abraham. It's time to make it happen. We're going to start living everyday life. We're going to make this happen. The Lord ain't going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. 
And you can. You can make things happen. We see it. Look what happened. Got that. Gave little Egypt the ring on the phone. Hey, little Egypt. She came out strutting. Hey. Wearing nothing but a ruby. Huh? We can make it happen. We, we, we can build the buildings. We can stuff the people in. We have all kinds of draw cards, but is it the Lord? Is, is it of the Lord? Psalm 127 says, Psalm 127 says, Verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. It didn't say it wasn't going to be built. It said they'll build the house, but it was all in vain. What do you mean? All in vain. Well, it couldn't have been in vain. Look at all the people. But they're not saved. Roman Catholic Church, how can they be saved? They got buildings in every city and country town and in every country in the world. Are they saved or is it all in vain? Hey, it's all vanity of vanity. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. Yeah, they will build it. It's one of my books that I wrote. Going back 15 years or more, they labour in vain. They labour in vain. There's nothing in the New Testament that talks about building buildings. The only thing I find in the New Testament is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach and teach and warn and baptize. That's the Great Commission. But they make it sound so great that they're building more buildings and putting a cross on the front and a rabbit next to it or Dagon rabbit, Dagonic rabbit, or a, 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 a Santa Claus Dagon next to it. Yes. And then they say, oh, this is the Lord. Come and see what the Lord has done. And, and, and the congregation have a $2.3 million mortgage and some of the congregation have put a double mortgage on their home to pay for it. And if you do, well, you're going to get the front seat in the new building and other fringe and sideburn benefits, <laughs> moustache benefits. Because you're a big dipper. It's time to make it happen. No, it's not time. It's time to do nothing. It's time to wait on the Lord. And he lift you up so you can see. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing Christ. <laughs> How sweet the word that saved a wretch like me. Saved by the word. Saved by the water of the word and the power of the Holy Ghost. Hey? Glory to the Lamb. 
Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain and build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Is it of the Lord? We all like to, to watch over all kinds of things to protect them, but is the Lord operating? Is it the Lord wanting them? Is it the Lord? That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Or you're working against the Lord when the Lord has said, no, I've restrained my hand. I've held back my hand from doing that for you because I have another plan. I've held that back from you. I've held that the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. People want to have their own way. They're still worshipping at the altar of the God of self-will. Hey? We know there's no... no, no Power at the altar of the God of self-will. Jesus showed us that through Gethsemane where he said, I'm not going to worship at the altar of self-will. I'm not going to worship the God of self-will. I'm going to worship you father i'm going to do what you want me not my will father but yours thine will and sarah i never said that abraham wasn't much better hey sarah i said to abraham see just in case he didn't she was making it clear god has done this god has done this how many times do people they know very well it's as clear as the nose on their face that mother nature has a father and mother nature doesn't operate solo Mother Nature has a father. And when they see the tsunami, they see the mudslide, they see the bushfires, they see the destruction, they see the earthquake, and they see all these things. And, but they still go on pig-headedly down the same road as they do and did in Bali, where we can't wait to get back to normal. Normal is another word for sinful. <laughs> and that is normal. It's a normal thing. It's the norm for the Edemic race. But it's abnormal for the Messianic race. It's not the norm. We know that by John the Beloved who said, if we sin, we have an avocado. I mean, no, we have an advocate. We have an advocate. Christ Jesus, who will cleanse us with his blood. This is not a, a daily ongoing occurrence. If, if we sin. Yeah? He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Place us in right standing with Father. Why do we have to be in right standing with Father? I thought it was all done and dusted with one saved, always saved. What do you got to be cleansed for? Aren't you acceptable with all those spots? 
in that Dalmatian church? 101 Dalmatians in our congregation. <laughs> Jesus ain't coming back for a polka dot church. Hey? So, Sarah said to Abram, Sarah I said, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please, Abraham, go into my maid. Perhaps, perhaps, I shall obtain children from her. Maybe. It's a stab in the dark on our own, isn't it? It's a stab in the dark. Maybe could be, I don't know. It's time to make it happen. It's a stab in the dark with Joyce Meyer, the Pentecostalism, the Evangelicalism, the Roman Catholicism. It's all a stab in the dark. It's all marketing skills and, and, and multicultural faith movements and all kinds of other gods being propped up Santa Claus and rabbits next to Jesus and saying, yes, we're all together, we are the world and we are the people. It's all just maybe, look, that's not good enough for me, perhaps, maybe. I don't like that language. It stinks. It, it, it smells of disorder. <laughs> I don't want it. The Lord Jesus teaches us that our yes is yes and our no is no and anything else is of the devil. Anything else is of the evil one himself. Maybe could be, I don't know. There's all kinds of uh, uh, surmisings there, isn't there? There's all kinds of confusion. That's what I love about Jesus. He nails it there and then. He always deals with it up front, in your face, shirt fronting, confrontational uh, uh, faith. Christos confrontation. I love it. And, and then I know where I am. Like, well, what are you doing? Are you in or are you out? What's it going to be? Don't waste your time. If you, if you don't want to be here, for crying out loud, go where you want to be. And stop bothering me and everyone else. I think that's loving and I think that's fair. I think that's order and I, I believe, not think, that that is Christ. Hey? Because that's the way the Lord dealt with the situation with the angels in heaven. He said, look, you want to go with Lucifer? Go. Don't stay here with a down look on your face. Go with, with Lucifer. If that's the way you want it and you want to be with them and rebel, go. Sarai said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Go into my mind and maybe I obtain a child or children by her and Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. You think he'd know better, wouldn't you? Especially when Sarah knew God doesn't want me to have a child at this time. But I'm going to do it my way. Hey? Look, we know that mankind just doesn't have the answers. We know that time and time and time again. Humanity just does not have the answers to, to the world's dilemma. We, we, we like to think that, you know, an Easter parade's going to do the job. You know? That, that is not the order of the Lord. They're, they're labouring in vain. 
then doing no better than the, the, than the rich man in Lazarus scenario when the rich man's burning in the fires of hell and said, look, it's time to make it happen, Abraham. <laughs> It's time to make it happen with my family. Now, this is what you're going to do. And Abraham said, no, I ain't going to do nothing of the sort. He said to the rich man, well, he should have said that to Sarah, shouldn't he? He should have said, oh, it's just not going to happen. It won't be happening, Sarah. Right? Little Egypt... Hagar, she bore the child, and boy, look what come with it. <laughs> look what come with it. I mean, it's still lingering today, isn't it? We're entrenched in the in the miserable, destructive, heartbreaking, and painful frightening terror of the child of little Egypt of Hagar where the whole world saturated in it now surely that is a, a, a big enough example surely that's driven the nail home Jesus uh, on the tree has made a way to avoid all that and to come out from under that curve. Come out from under that Egyptian curve. And walk in the victory on higher ground. See, the outworking of the cross enables us to enjoy not everyday life, but a better life. A new and living way. The other way is dead. It's a dead end and it's dead. The world always has to try and make something happen. They're always, you know, it's time to make it happen. It's time to go here. It's time to go there. It's time to do this. It, oh, look, we'll have a barbecue. We'll have a picnic. We'll have this. And they're always trying to, you know, it's all like staying alive, staying alive. Ha, 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 staying alive. Yeah, the Teeth Brothers. <laughs> What's their name? The Teeth Brothers. The Bee Gees. Staying alive. <laughs> Trying everything in the book. Travelling hither and thither. With or without Heather. But... The Lord says no to it all. The Lord says no, it's all in me. The one stop shop. Jesus. Wait. Be still. And know that I am Lord. For he is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He has risen from the dead. And He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. That Jesus, the Christ, is Lord. He is Lord. And if you make Jesus your Lord, you're going to mount up with the wings like eagles. Everyday life will never be enough ever again. And to have something more than everyday life, you've got to go into planetary. <laughs> you have to go on to that other planet, that other zenith. Right? 
You have to go in the spirit. You have to go by faith in the Son of God. That's where it all is, isn't it? Faith in the Son of God. Oh, man. Look what they've done in Hebrews 11. The faith chapter. Subdued kingdom. Raised the dead. Forsook everyday life. Gave up their everyday life as martyrs, stoned to death. Gave up the riches of Egypt, considered them as dung, considered the persecution and, and, and the suffering of Christ greater riches than were in Egypt. By faith, that's what faith can do in Christ. When we take faith, hey, we got it all. We got Father and Son and Holy Ghost, angels and brethren in the Word of God. We've got it all. Let's press on. There's a greater and a more a heavenly country awaiting us. We desire something better. We desire something greater than everyday life. It's time to make it happen, Joyce Meyer says. It's time to make it happen. It's time to start enjoying everyday life. How far behind is Joyce? She is retarded in the spiritual realm. Obviously never tasted of the zenith. She's never been in the sacred place of the Most High or abided in the shadow of the Almighty. Hey? Dear, 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 dear. Easter parades. Hey? Or living letters. What are we going to be? Living letters? Or Easter parades? Is it going to be debate? Are we going to debate about Jesus? and the Bible and the truth? Or are we just going to learn to accept for those who received him? That's just automatic, spontaneous reception, isn't it? He gave the right to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. That's fine. Debating is not fine. Holding baptismal classes is not fine. Everything must be done by faith in the Son of God. Our walk, our living, our baptisms, our, our blessings, our joy, our peace, everything's by faith. In the Son of God, can someone say amen? Not debates, accept, accept. What's it going to be? Peace talks, or the Prince of Peace? Maybe better put peace talk. It's only talk, isn't it? But Jesus. The Prince of Peace is God. I'm not talking talk. I'm talking Him. Elohim. But they're still like their peace talk. They're always talking about peace. Forget the talking. Lay hold of Him who laid hold of for you at the tree. Lay hold of that which He laid hold of for you. The high call. Of Father through the Christ. Lay hold of it. Today. By faith. Yes Jesus. I accept. The call. I accept. I accept. The anointing. I accept. The everything. 
I accept what you have said. I accept that if you say no, it's no. I accept that I'm not just called to believe, but to suffer for your name's sake. Philippians hey, 1.29. Or is it 2.29? I think it's 1.29. Hey, I'll just run a check on that. Philippians. 129. Exactly. What's it going to be? Thy will be done or your will be done. Hey? It's not time to make it happen. Everywhere in the Bible where people stepped out, they're going to make it happen and they're going to do this. Always disaster. These are the sons of God who are led by the Spirit of God. Hey? Brother Phil was out yesterday in the shopping area and then he was texting me a tab and a bit and he was out and about. Next minute he's saying, now I'm over here with these other people, now I'm in the car park, now I'm there, someone else, and now I'm doing this. Then he was letterboxing, led by the Spirit. Within an hour he was consumed by the work of the Lord. Led by the Spirit. Not I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, but he's going to do it. And he's going to do it through me. Hey? Not multi. Multicultural gods. But one God. There is one God. There's one Lord. One Saviour. One mediator between Father and mankind. His name is Jesus. One and one alone. Way to heaven. I am the way, Jesus said. I am the truth and I am the life. And you will never enjoy everyday life and you will never enjoy the life of Christ until we repent, turn to Jesus from our sin and pick up our cross and deny ourselves of sin and follow him daily. He'll take you on to another plateau altogether. The truth and walking in the truth is another zone. Totally different way. That's why it's called a new and living way, walking in it. And in the book of Acts, the disciples of Jesus were known as people of the way. Or the Christ. People of the Christ. They weren't known as Christians. They were known as people of the way. Or the Christ. People of the anointing. That's what Christ means. It means anointed. People of the anointed one. One. Not multicultural. The anointed one. The Christ. We are Jesus, the anointed one, ministry. We're of the anointed one. And his anointing is on us. Running all over us, even as the oil down the beard of Aaron. Hallelujah. Onto the garments. 
how beautiful it is to see the brethren in unity. Right? How wonderful to see the people of the way, anointed ones, hearkening and heeding the voice of the Lord. This is the way. Walk ye in it, Jesus says. This is the way. I am the way. Walk ye in it. And you will find rest for your soul. Right? As the Lord said to Eve, we see the same thing played out here with Sarah. Don't touch the tree. The Lord said to Adam and Eve, don't touch that tree. The Lord showed and said to Sarai, Sarai said to Abraham, see now the Lord has restrained me. The Lord would have spoken to Sarai and said, no. But how many disasters I've seen over the decades. People know it's a no from Jesus, but they go ahead anyway. They don't wait on the Lord. And what happens? Even down to holidays. They go on holidays. Ends up a disaster. They buy houses. Ends up a disaster. The Lord doesn't want them to buy the house. You say, but everyone does. It's the great Australian dream. You've been lied to. It's not. You're dreaming. It might be the great Australian dream or the great American dream to own your own home. But it's not the disciple of Christ's dream. <laughs> the disciple of the Christ dream is a reality. It's Jesus. Becoming more real by the day. Becoming more tangible by the moment. He touched me. Oh, yes, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something, something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. He touched me. The Lord Jesus, once he touches you, your eyes automatically just ricochet off the world onto him. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're saying, I see Jesus standing at Father's right hand. I see Jesus wandering across the land. <laughs> oh dear oh dear oh dear hey? the God of self will hey? how many worship at the altar of the God of self will every endemic person on planet earth and that's only one of their gods <laughs> so we really really are multicultural country aren't we We really, truly are. It's a multicultural world. With multicultural gods. All coming together. All sitting next to Jesus. Very impatiently and disorderly. Sitting there. <laughs> Knowing that the only thing that can come out of it is disaster. 
ongoing. Even a Muslim religion, an Ishmaelic religion, whose mum was Little Egypt. <laughs> oh, little Egypt came out strutting, wearing nothing but a rubby and a toe. She did the hoochie coochie real slow. Praise his holy name, eh? But we're all, I mean, at least Christendom, the One World Church, the Ecumenical Church, the emergent church and the world are, are very willing to overlook these snares. Very willing to overlook Sarai's blunder and Eve's mess. Hey? Right? My son, Brother Shadrach, his reading this morning came out of Luke 13. And I, I thought very, very <coughs> synonymous with today's message. And he didn't know what I was going to be teaching on today. If we go to Luke 13, please. All right. Go to Luke 13 if you have a Bible. Luke 13. If you have a Bible there. Luke 13, brother. Yeah. We go to Luke 13, verse 24, and what does it say? Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You see, that this message today is a message on striving, not seeking. This is not Peter, Paul and Mary stuff, you know. This is striving. This is getting down to tooth and nail, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, finer points, striving to enter. Many will seek the multicultural churches, the emergent, one world churches, they're all seekers. They're, they're all allowed Peter, Paul and Mary into the meeting. They, they, they've all allowed <coughs> the different gods and curses and, and traditions and, and, and uh, schisms of culture and tradition that override the word of God. They've allowed it into the house of the Lord and in a word, it's letting Dagon back into the temple. It's putting Dagon next to Jesus. What the Spirit is saying here today is that multicultural gods and guidance is nothing useful at all to the saving of the soul. Handless, headless guidance. Statues, idols, made of stone, wood or whatever you want that are not able to help you be uh, meek, loving, kind, patient, orderly, person can someone say amen because most of the multicultural gods and idols are all about violence and war and warrior and most of them are just warriors full of fear and self-preservation protecting oneself i have to learn self-defense to protect myself no that's not that is not the way of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That is not the way. There's no more self protection when you come to Jesus. There's no more doing uh, 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 um, uh, UFC. 
There's no more doing uh, martial arts and, and boxing and self-defense. Forget that. Throw it in the bin. Throw it out with Dagon. It's now turn the other cheek. It's now uh, res do not resist an evil man. It's now vengeance belongs to the Lord. It, it's now um, martyrdom for the master. It's now, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. I no longer live my life for me or anyone else, but for him who died for me, the cruel death upon the tree. And everybody said, amen. and amen and amen. Right? So, at the end of the day, it's a babelic mindset, isn't it? Multicultural uh, uh it's time to make it happen. That's Babel revisited. They're the words of Joyce Meyer. It's time to make it happen. It's time to start enjoying everyday life. There's no end to the Adamic enjoying everyday life. There's no end to it. I mean, the nips just keep getting bigger. <laughs> oh yeah, the nips are getting bigger. Started out just drinking beer. Didn't know why or what I was even doing here. Started with some cooch, ended up on acid. Oh yeah, the nips are getting bigger. Before you know it, you're on methylated spirits. Right? It's edemic. It's babelic. <laughs> it's it, it's worshipping at the altar of the God of self will. Hey? Eh? All comes back, doesn't it? They're building. They're all building out there. It's the it, it's the confirmation of the prophecy that I pen 30 page book over 15 years ago and I said in my book they labor in vain it will be man's last bastion to build 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 the endemic the endemic churches build 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 and what are they doing have a look in your own suburb. Buildings, buildings, buildings. Biz that claim to fame and their stamp upon the earth. Self-satisfying. They're building more churches than ever. They're building more buildings and more buildings. And they labour in vain. It amounts to nothing of heaven. It amounts to nothing of the saving of the soul. It's like Babel building their way to heaven. Hogwash, total hogwash. Jesus said, I am the way. Eh? Jesus said, I am the truth. And I am the light. Glory to the Lamb today. Eh? Time of our message today. It's time to make it happen, to enjoy everyday life. When you're born again, you're finished with everyday life. It's not enough. It just doesn't cut the mustard. It's just not cricket. Hey? <laughs> Enjoying everyday life. It's, look, Jesus is far beyond 2,000. He's far beyond everyday life. Hey? We got a foretaste of glory divine now. <laughs> Enjoy him. Enjoy Jesus. Every minute of the day. When you sit down and make yourself a cup of tea. Oh, and you sit back there and say, Oh, Jesus. How great thou art. And you spend the entire cup of tea praising Jesus. Thanking him. Oh, Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. Eh? 
more costly than silver. You're, you're the great I am, Jesus. What else can be said? I can't wait to get home. Oh, Lord. Everybody said, and amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus.